Hello everybody, um, good morning, I hope you're keeping safe and well. My name is Richard Catling and I'm a partner in our corporate team at Altamimi and together with Luwal Abdul Hadi, my co-presenter, we are the family business practice of, of Altamimi and we've been working closely with family business and ultra high net worth individuals for the best part of uh, 10 years now at the firm. Um, and obviously we find ourselves in interesting times uh, and unfortunately as a result of those interesting times the general economy and family businesses in addition are feeling some economic pain at the moment uh, hopefully that's a temporary circumstance and that we will see our way out of the uh, current uh, time um, in, in good health um, but at the moment at least uh, times are difficult and along with economic pain can also come some sort of existential angst if you like uh, it's when family businesses and owners of businesses and people involved in business are thinking about their their businesses um, I'm not suggesting that it's only family business owners that have an, an emotional tie to their business because obviously we're all very concerned for the well-being of our our colleagues and our staff and our business and, and our livelihoods in general but I think it's a it's fair to say that family businesses are quite unique in so far as obviously the owners <clears throat> have grown up with the businesses, developed those businesses over a long period of time and do have uh, emotional ties to, to, to the business and obviously want to ensure that it succeeds and continues to flourish. I mean, to use an analogy, you know, CEOs in public listed companies, uh, they can come and go. Uh, they can be in their position for a couple of years, sometimes even less, and then they, they move on. Um, they're often incentivized by the share price. And really all they're concerned about, I mean, it's a slightly cynical view, but the market sentiment being in their favor, because it's quite often that that, that they're incentivized to uh, ensure. Uh, remains the case uh, and quite often what that means is they'll take short-term business decisions um, because they will provide immediate results but often those decisions can have long-term ramifications. Uh, now I'm not saying that family business owners don't have the same pressures upon their shoulders and don't make, make the same mistakes if indeed those decisions can be mistakes but, but I, what I do think is the very nature of the relationship uh, between a family business owner and their respective business or particular business means that quite often they can have quite a different approach to how they look at their business um, and can and have the ability to think uh, in a more long-term fashion. Um, now obviously in, in times like this business owners of all types are, are going to look at their business, look inwards and ask themselves is the business robust enough to survive? And they're going to take sensible pragmatic decisions so they're going to look at their cash flow cons conservation cost savings uh, re-evaluations of strategy um, but what, what i think is interesting is that noel and i have found that um, when talking to our family business owner clients in in recent months that often family business owners are also using this opportunity to think as i said in the longer term at the longer term horizon uh, and thinking also you know, not only is how the business is going to survive this, this immediate period, but how it's going to come out the other side. What, what are, what's going to be the result of this, of this, of this, this period that we're in? And really what I'm saying is that they're also taking this opportunity to look at the, the structuring of their business on a more macro, um, a macro level, uh, thinking about whether or not their business is appropriately structured. Because, I mean, I think one thing that we can definitely say is that if, there are issues facing a business um, and those businesses and those issues are pervasive or to do with the structure of the business in in good times they're going to have quite um, substantial issues for a business but in, in in bad economic times or in difficult times those issues can really be magnified um, so this is really an opportunity we found for when we're talking to our clients for them to think more broadly about how their business is set up and what they can do uh, to ensure that they're taking the right decisions at the right time. And, and, I, and I don't want to, 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 to dance around the subject, but obviously if, if, you're, if, if significant power and authority is vested in one or two individuals, 
I mean, I don't know about anyone else on this webinar, but at some point in this crisis, especially early on when it wasn't entirely clear just how just how uh, dangerous the virus um, was going to be, and look, it's proven to be pretty dangerous. I mean, we've you know we've seen the the death rates, mortality rates. I mean, it is a, obviously a quite horrible disease, but you can't help but think about your own mortality, and quite often family business owners have spent their lives growing and building a business and almost feel superhuman and, and they're, 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 su they're such success, successful people but as people get older as generations below grow and expand uh, and, and look to get involved in the business it's only natural that at these sorts of times people are going to think to themselves what happens once i've gone what's what, what's my legacy what am i handing over to the next generation so again i think it's really concentrated the minds of business owners now uh, in the current climate we've seen to really look at the business and think is this structured for the long term so the purpose of this um uh webinar today, Luol and I are going to take, hopefully, it's, it's the time is scheduled for an hour, so we, we will see how we go, but about an hour to talk to you about a number of topics. So initially, um, Joe, if you can move to the next slide, <clears throat> what we'll be talking about are the common problems facing family businesses. Um, now, obviously, when clients come to us, um, quite often, every family business being different, um, but we do quite often see some common themes that run through quite a lot of the structures that, that we're used to seeing and that we advise on. So, so we can, what we can do is pull out some of those for you, and you, you may see um, uh, your, your own business uh, that you're involved in mirrored in some of those structures, or think some of these issues might actually apply to you also. Um, we'll also look at a slide with, a, with a, a common structure that we see, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that can arise from how these structures um, uh, are, are currently organised. And quite a lot of these businesses have, have grown up organically over time, and, and in growth mode, it's not necessarily the first thought of the, uh, of the owner to, to structure it in a way uh, with 20, 30 years hence at the front of their mind. They're thinking about the ability to capture those commercial opportunities early and quickly and capitalize upon them. So when you take a very fastly growing business and, and see it move to a more mature stage, which most of these businesses now are in, that's when you're going to see the opportunity um, to, to look at ways to structure the business with that next phase, if you like, of its life, um, of the business's life at, at the forefront of the mind. Um, how can we get from a particularly disorganized business or, or at least a business with particular issues in it to an optimal structure? We'll look about some of the techniques and tools and things that family business owners should be thinking about to make that change. We'll, uh, we'll also show a, um, an, an optimal family business structure. We say optimal, but of course, every family structure and every business being different, there is no one size fits all approach, but we'll at least look at some themes and some, some topics that, that family owners can, can think about when they're restructuring. Um, we can't divorce uh, the, the, the family business from the more general legal and regulatory environment in the GCC. Uh, and so we'll think about some of those issues when thinking about how one takes a business into the next stage, uh, particularly in respect of any restructuring. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the Sharia issues that will be pervasive to all family businesses in the region and, and how they can be navigated. So, um, Joe, if we move to the, the next slide. So, on this slide, we just list some of the, the key issues that, that, that we often find that um, family businesses face. And it's, these are really the, the key issues that are going to determine, I think, as lawyers, our advice um, to a client when thinking about restructuring, but also we do have at the forefront of, the mi of our mind exactly what it is that the, um, our client is trying to achieve because a restructuring can mean many, many different things. And when they're approaching a restructuring, what in effect they're doing is they're looking to resolve particular issues that they might have in relation to that business. So for example, it might be simply a case of how do I ensure that the business is passed on for succession purposes without any issues uh, being faced by the business at that time of succession. Or it might be that the business isn't properly um, set up for more business-related reasons, 
for example, maybe they're looking down the line at potential IPO or uh, disposals of certain aspects of the business. So there's different ways of looking at it. Uh, and obviously those issues are the ones that we would be uh, looking at and being keen to advise clients on um, and make sure that we're actually um, meeting their objectives. Um, so I'm just going to pass over now to Nawal, who's going to talk in a little bit of detail about some of these issues and, and, and how we see them arise in the context of our family businesses. Nawal, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As Richard said, we uh, see a lot of challenges and problems facing family businesses, specifically in the region. Each family is different. Each family has its own issues, its own problems, but we usually see common problems uh, uh, facing most of the families in business. Uh, the main or the most common uh, problem is the fragmentation of ownership and fragmentation of control as a result of inheritance uh, uh, processes, which leads to uh, shareholders factions and uh, courts interference, specifically where we have minors uh, 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 where we have heirs including minors we often see that property ownership is splintered between several stakeholders or family members and operating the same is done through poas uh, uh, and um, um, exhaustive uh, uh, approval processes uh, there's usually no limitation of liability where all the liabilities and risks of the business are personal liabilities of the founder or the family stakeholders this also applies to liability arising out of the real property assets specifically constructed real property such as any um, a serious accident or a fire uh, uh, in such properties another common problem is the lack of a proper corporate holding structure where there's no consolidation of financial and management under one holding uh, structure and no separation of core fixed assets from operating risks and liabilities, no separation between uh, uh, active and passive assets. Um, and another common problem we see is that there's no readiness for a future, as Richard said, maybe a future IPO, uh, a future sell down. Uh, we see a lot of dependence on personal guarantees as opposed to corporate guarantees. So these are some of the problems uh, uh, that are most commonly seen with family businesses in the region. Well, I think, Noel, I think the, the one we really need to concentrate on, at least talk in a little bit more detail about, is the effect that the inheritance laws plays on, on, on family succession. Because, I mean, look, I think nearly all family businesses have, have one primary owner and, um, you know, patriarch, if you like, the founder, as we would normally uh, refer to him or, or, or sometimes her. Um, and, and when you have concentrated power and control, a business is often very well run because you have one decision maker um, you also have one owner so there's no sense that in, in, in with with one person that there's any competing interests in the business um, because there's only one person to worry about but obviously yeah. as we know understand you know families in the region and it's a particular characteristic of this of this part of the world that the successive generation can be many people um, and the way that the inheritance laws works means that and unfortunately, you know, the inheritance laws are rather inflexible in, in this regard, is that everyone is having a competing interest in a business, but not everybody is necessarily going to be, and let's face it, in most cases, this is the case, not as able and as adept as running the business as that founder. And so quite often, and we've seen many cases over the years, um, where inter-family disputes at times of succession can, can have serious um, impacts impact. on, on the business. True, and especially Richard, given that each family member or family heir has his own or her own agenda. Some are interested in the business, are interested in, in maintaining the continuity of the business. Others just want cash out of the business. They really don't care whether the business continues or not. So each family member, each heir comes with a different agenda. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this makes it more challenging. Definitely. And, and look, it's not just the inheritance law, is it? It's also because we have to look at everything in the, in the general legal environment. Most yeah. businesses are set up in a corporate fashion. 
Um, though, actually, I mean, you know, we often see sole establishments in, in some of these business structures as well. But generally speaking, we're dealing with corporate entities that are set up under the commercial companies law in the UAE, for example, or the local um, similar corporate law of the, you know, whichever jurisdiction it is that we're talking about. And, and you know, by the way, all of these issues are just as relevant if we're in Saudi or Kuwait yes. or Bahrain. I mean, we are talking about a relatively common legal environment. And, and the problem with the local companies laws is, is they also are quite inflexible when we're looking at structuring a company to take into account those those different aspects of the different people's agendas and own ownership, wouldn't you say? Yes, well? yes, yes. I mean, the most commonly used vehicle uh, uh, in the GCC is the limited liability company. And as you said, for example, in the UAE, it's subject to the company's law, commercial company's law, which makes the partners the ultimate controlling uh, body of the entity. So really, and, and there's significant or certain resolutions that need uh, either unanimity or a majority approval from these partners. So unless, and, and there's no room of flexibility in relation to such reserved matters. So unless the partners, the family stakeholders are all on the same page, or at least, you know, have the same vision, it will be very difficult to to uh, continue the business and, 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 and uh, uh, develop the business uh, in light of these restrictions. Yeah, no, and look, I, I'm, I'm sure our audience are looking forward to, to seeing how some of these issues can be resolved but I, I think it's important just to paint a picture of a founder with maybe um, two three spouses each with uh, a number of sons and daughters now under the general sharia inheritance principles which for example in the uae are codified whereas in saudi they're not but this, the same principles apply or, or on the death of the founder the inheritance court is going to make an order which will result in a solely owned uh, limited liability company suddenly having 20 30 potential shareholders and and the result of that is obviously a very very different situation one day you have a business with one person sitting in an office signing all of the relevant documentation uh, resolutions approving x y and z and then the next day, suddenly management is faced with 20, 30 actors all trying to get involved. And it's not it's not hard to see why that can be such a disaster for a, for yeah. a family. Yeah. So, yeah. OK, so, so well, let, let's move on to the, uh, the next so slide. The, and, and this is sort of just a diagrammatic representation, really, of, of exactly what it is. And while you were talking about on the exactly. earlier slide, uh, exactly. maybe you can talk so, a little bit about what you see here. Exactly. So as you can see from this commonly seen structure with family businesses in the region, um, we see a founder who uh, owns in his personal name uh, several assets businesses. So um, let's just quickly see the founder owns 100% of a manufacturing limited liability company with operating branches in and out the UAE. He also is the he also personally owns several real property assets, whether hotels, residential or commercial offices. He acts in his personal capacity as a direct UAE sponsor in a logistics um, business. And he owns a couple of, of sole establishments. One is a party to several G, uh, JVs and another owns a residential property. And this is a very commonly used structure that we often see. Um, the first comment I make on this structure is that there is no um, there's no structure in place to contain and quarantine contingent, contingent liabilities and financial risks. There is no holding structure to consolidate the management and the business and separates um, um, active from passive assets, separate operating risks, ring fence such operating risks. Another comment I make is that, as you can see, there's no insulation from direct legal involvement of Sharia courts. So if the founder passes away tomorrow, we will see inheritance court processes interfering with the assets and business, particularly if the, the, the heirs include minors. 
Um, another uh, uh, comment or problem I see is that there's no limitation of liability. So the founder is personally liable to any accidents, any issues arising out of the constructed real property. The founder is also liable to any business uh, liabilities arising out of the sole establishments because a sole establishment does not have its separate legal identity from its owner. So any liabilities will flow back to the owner. Even with the UAE operating branches under the manufacturing LLC, uh, uh, any a branch obviously is, is, is a part of its parent entity and does not have a separate legal identity. So any issues or operating risks arising out of these branches will also entail the parent entity and flow up to the parent entity. Yeah, I mean, I think... So, it's obviously right to say that no one would actually set out to design a business structure like this if they had a blank piece of paper and were setting out to, 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 to start business. So, I mean, as I said earlier, these things have grown up this way because yeah. business owners have seen opportunities and have moved quickly and, had, and to be fair, have probably not had uh, the right advice during the course of yeah. the, the, the life cycle of, of the business, if you like. But, but the, 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 the issue with this, of course, is that every business is often exposed to litigation uh, and risk in general. Uh, you know, thinking about maybe if you're looking at how insurance would be, uh, would be uh, part of, of, of your thinking, insurers would probably not be keen to seeing residential properties being held, uh, oh, sorry, significant real estate assets, for example, being held in, 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 in the direct name of, of the owner, yeah. and, and certainly your bankers wouldn't be either. I mean, one thing that we, we do see is that th these sort of structures do heavily rely on personal guarantees. Personal guarantees, true, uh, true. Uh, and, and in the absence of the founder, you know, on, the, on his inheritance, that's also going to include, cause immediate issues because the, the securitization of the structure is, is no longer there at the point at which the inheritors take over. Um, yeah. Also, uh, the fact that you would have, for example, a company that just, you know, because it did at the time, for whatever reason, acquire a significant real estate asset, but was also involved in agency uh, or, or whatever, or manufacturing or some distribution, some other, um, other uh, aspect of the business, well, you know, if, as you say, uh, there was any sort of uh, fire or, or other disastrous re uh, claim of it for, that required insurance or something that happened to that asset, that's going to immediately affect the ability for that particular company or part of the business to conduct its, its, its operations, given the liability. So it really is uh, a disaster waiting to happen, really. Yeah, and and we 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 uh, uh, often see that you know the cost is an important element, and I'll talk later on about the cost. But I mean, it's important also for uh, family owners to understand that sometimes yes, there's a cost element. However, it is something to prepare for the future. So, um, uh, for example, maybe some you know it's 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 cheaper and more time efficient to establish a, a sole establishment as opposed to a limited liability company. However, you know there's no limitation of liability. There's other you know uh, disadvantages and pitfalls of having the sole establishment. So this should be carefully considered uh, in 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 any family restructuring. Yeah. So I think it's fair to say that 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 the uh quite commonly seen family business structures can have issues both from a family perspective, but also from a business perspective. So if we move on to the next slide, I think what we would want to do, and when we, when we see our um, uh, clients uh, and they first start to talk to us about some of the issues that they see that, that they're facing in their business, um, as I said earlier, uh, they have their own ideas in mind as to what's important. So I think for, for any client uh, looking to, to reappraise their business, potentially restructure or put in place some sort of legal arrangements to protect it, the first thing that they really need to do is just think about what it is that's important to them. Now, there's obviously going to be some common themes running throughout family businesses. Uh, and, and whilst each family is, 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 going to, is obviously uh, specific and unique and there will be nuances, there are, as I said, those common themes are normally vested in thinking about the succession to the next generation of, of business ownership. Um, and so thinking about that, I think one thing it's important to do is to sort of do on a obviously much more detailed uh, basis what we were just doing, looking at a structure, is look at your current business and think to yourself, 
where are the weak points? Where are the issues that can come up? Or as we like to call it, a, a stress test, which we often will do with um, families, both pre and post the restructuring to make sure that what we're doing is really going to stand the test of time. Because everything that, that family business owners are looking to do are, are usually with you know, their family uh, in mind, and therefore they want to ensure that the business succeeds and, so, and, and continues to do so, but it's gonna have long-term prospects. And so on that basis, they need to look at what the current arrangements are now and take advice, both from lawyers and other professionals <clears throat> to see how they can move that aspect of the business and put it in on a, on a surer footing. Um, but because we're talking about family, it's not simply a question that I think they need to ask themselves. I think they need to have also uh, regard to the attitude of the next generation. It, it, it sounds obvious, but you know, you need to speak to your family members and you need to engage them in the process. Quite often founders will because that's the way they've always operated, as every parent does with their children, think that they know what's best for their, for their kids. But we're also thinking about what happens once you've gone, and you need to ensure that the right people in terms of the family members are involved and, and, and make clear and make it possible for the family to be comfortable with the business as it moves to the next generation. And so I think what I'm saying here is you need to have regard to what the family thinks when you're thinking of how you want the business to survive, because when you're gone, it will be up to them to ensure that it continues. Now, obviously, there are ways to ensure that it does, and in particular, you know, bringing in outside management and separating out ownership from management. And there are um, aspects of restructurings that we do for clients, which has that as its primary goal. But it's something just to think about anyway. But, but, but once you've done that, and once you've had the opportunity to think and you understand and you know what you want to do, well, the next thing to do really is to implement the appropriate legal structure for the business. And in effect, what we're talking about here is putting in place an appropriate holding structure, because the holding structure is the nexus between the family and the business. It's sort of the, the link. It's the most important link. But as in any chain, if there's a weak link anywhere, well, then the whole chain breaks. And what you need to do is to work out which is the appropriate holding structure for your family, uh, thinking about some of the opportunities and the tools available to you now in, in, in both UAE and the wider GCC region to effectively structure. And there are definitely things that you can do now that you couldn't even do a couple of years ago or a decade ago. Uh, we do have the opportunity to uh, use some of the best laws uh, in the world that have been designed specifically with wealth preservation in mind. Um, uh, at least when I talk to the legislators and the people who come up with the laws, that's what they tell me anyway. But no, generally, I think we are very lucky to have some of the, the, the best practice available in the region in terms of um, corporate laws, trust laws, foundations, etc., available to us to restructure. Um, in addition to the holding structure, we also need to look at the underlying business and assets. And of course, there's a restructuring that's going to have to happen there to ensure that there are limited liability companies in place, that there are effective siloing of assets, that sole establishments are not pervasive through the structure, that there are corporate guarantees, not personal guarantees. So there's a whole review of the entire structure, and it can be, if it's necessary for it to be, a root and branch uh, approach, reforming the entire business. Then again, the business might be very well structured and all you really need to do is to fixate and ensure that the relationship between the family members and the business is, is, is in the best shape that it can be. Um, one important thing, uh, and, and that's not often, not often ensured, is that, that people need to understand that a legally binding agreement among stakeholders is, is important because that's not always the case that we see. Um, Richard, sorry, uh, if, if, if maybe because we commonly see families telling us, oh, we have a family constitution in place. So I think maybe it's worth emphasizing, you know, um, 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 the difference of having a legal binding ag agreement as opposed to a 300 page family constitution. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, I'm glad you asked me that question, because, I mean, it's one of the common themes that, that we do see is that clients because it's been something that's been out there and, and family know obviously families talk to each other at Majlis and elsewhere and, and, and they understand that 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 what they should as have some sort of charter some sort of declaration if you like of how the family operates its ethos 
um, its approach to the business and to each other. And so quite often what we see put in place is a family constitution. The problem with yeah. family constitutions is they're not necessarily legally enforceable. I mean, they can be, but quite often people think that because it runs to, as you say, 300 pages, for some reason, family constitutions are always very large documents or have a tendency to be so. And I think that's because they're trying to attack everything at once and cover every potential aspect of the business, sometimes not as well as they should. Um, but the tendency is to produce these documents and because they're quite impressive things, everyone says, oh, well, you know, there, we can always rely on that in the future. Unfortunately, these family constitutions are normally designed by the founder. And of course, as, as we said earlier, they have to survive the death of the founder. And quite often, once the founder isn't there to ensure that the family members do as they're told, because that's what founders are particularly good at, is ensuring that family members do what they're told, um, quite often they are likely to stray off script, as it were, in terms of what the family constitution says. And then when, when family members find that actually the courts are not going to give effect to or enforce um, these family arrangements, uh, then, then, then they're in, the family can often find itself in trouble. Um, Sorry, I'm just looking at the question we received. Uh, do you recommend a foundation structure under DIC and ADGM in case of succession strategy? And to what extent the foundation is strong facing any challenge in the courts in relation to depriving an heir from legacy which is right under the, under the Sharia? Well, well, we'll touch on that in a minute. I think we're going we're to get to that when we yeah. think about structures. But um, because a foundation is is one, as I mentioned earlier, one of the potential tools in the in the kit bag, as it were, for the toolbox of of, of, of um, professionals who are structuring family businesses. But just to go back to the family constitution, it can be, but it's most likely not going to be legally binding, and so it's it's inherently problematic because if it's not legally binding, you can't rely on it in the courts, and therefore, if there's a dispute, the court's not going to have regard to it. So you do have to be careful to ensure that what you do put in place is either an appropriate shareholder agreement or a foundation charter or even just simply your memorandum of association for your company being in a form which is enforceable um, which it should be of course um, you know or, or a trust whatever it is that, that, that you're advised you know or that you decide is the appropriate way of governing the business it needs to be uh, in a legally binding uh, format and and it's important to note that um, um, obviously problems do not arise when the founder or the patriarch is there because generally, you know, uh, uh, from a culture, culture perspective, from a family perspective, you know, usually the founder, you know, instructs the family members and they're all happy to follow the founder's instructions. Problems arise at the transition, transition where the founder passes away and he's no longer there. And, and this is where problems start to arise. And hence, you need legally binding arrangements to ensure the continuity uh, uh, of the business. Obviously, when we say legally binding arrangements, this does not mean that there's no flexibility. I mean, the flexibility is there. However, it's, it's something to ensure that, that at transition, the business will not be at risk and the continuity will not be at risk. Definitely. And, and as I said earlier, I mean, fa fa family constitutions do have a tendency to throw the kitchen sink in, if you like, to try and cover every potential aspect yeah. of how the business uh, could be run or the issues it might face in the future, whether that's, you know, the sort of utilization of a family bank concept or family office or thinking about preemption in, in terms of uh, transfer of ownership between family members, potentially an exit, how management's going to work, corporate governance, all of these things. Again, as I said, if they're not legally binding, they don't really mean very much, unfortunately. So I think what is, is very important when structuring and when considering the, the legally binding document, again, whether that's a constitutional document or it's a trust deed or it's a charter or it's a memorandum of association, whatever it is, to focus on the key aspects that really are important in terms of the business. And really that is the, the uh, equitable arrangement of uh, ownership. So who owns what in what proportion? And, and thinking about that from a charity compliant perspective, if that's the um, if that's requirement for the family. Um, also thinking about governance. Because at the end of the day, I think the, the key aspect for a family business is to ensure that it's properly run and that the owners have certain rights vis-a-vis -vis that ownership, but not, not sufficient rights that they, can, uh, that they can involve themselves to too great an extent if it's not appropriate that they should do so. Now, obviously, 
the second generation ideally would be involved in management and so it's important to ensure that that can be the case but as a founder you need to ensure that the longevity of the business is there by ensuring that the structure cannot be undermined and particularly in relation to challenges arising from from inheritance as well uh, we, we wouldn't want a um, uh, for whatever reason a family member that doesn't like what's being put in place by the founder to immediately be able to go to court the next day and unwind the entire structure because as Noel said earlier some family members are not interested in the business would much rather have their their cash allocation and to take it uh, and so in that sense one of the key aspects I think for a legally binding arrangement is to actually contemplate that event and to provide for it so in other words an exit mechanism now that's something that's quite hard to do in the uh, commercial companies law because of the requirement for pretty much all shareholders to agree to any any major decision that, that fundamentally changes the business including for example just a transfer of shares it can be done but there are better ways of, of doing it so um, just before we move to the next slide just touching on corporate governance because we've already mentioned it but think, thinking about that in a little bit more detail what exactly do we mean well you know again a business that's been run by one person for a very long time or at least overseen by one person with ultimate power and authority for a very long time doesn't particularly need good corporate governance because at the end of the day that person is always going to be there to take a decision but if that person isn't there to take a decision then appropriate policies and processes need to be in place with a properly um, uh, constructed board of professionals and family members who are in the right place and have the right decision-making matrices, if you like, in place to be able to take those decisions with reference to the higher authority being the shareholder base or the, the beneficiaries of a trust or whatever it is to take those really big decisions uh, that the, the business might face in its lifetime, such as an IPO or moving into a very different business area, these sorts of things, to ensure that, that the business, the management of the business runs the business in the ordinary course within a framework that has been provided for it and is able to go to uh, the organ of uh, decision making at the highest level like the shareholder assembly or the family assembly or whatever you want to call them to take those really big decisions and then lower down having committees in place to deal with things uh, with um, terms of reference uh, so that everybody knows what that committee is there to do it has a clear modus operandi and it can deliver on its mandate, whether that's the remuneration and incentivization of key family members going forward, or whether it's um, uh, dealing with the, uh, the personal assets and uh, other aspects of the family wealth that are derived through the corporate structure. There are lots of different things that should be done and professional advice should be taken uh, to ensure that best standards apply throughout. Um, but let, let's move on because we only have so much time to the um, optimal structure just to see what it looks like and now this is an example it's not really the optimal structure because of course immediately you can see we're talking about a shareholder agreement here um, that could be replaced with a foundation or it, uh, which in which case at the top of the tree sorry but let me start again there's a holding company with shareholder SPVs above each of which is party to a shareholder agreement if that were replaced with a foundation, for example, then you wouldn't have a shareholder agreement, you'd have a charter and bylaws. Um, but it, 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 it's the, the same theme is there. Basically, you have a legally binding agreement in some shape or form. It could be a trust deed, for example, um, with a, a, a PTC acting as trustee for and on behalf of a number of, uh, of beneficiaries. Um, that's the most important aspect. And then going down further, you would have a, a holding company under which all of the assets are, are centralized. And then looking at the underlying structure, obviously what you want is best practice in terms of ensuring that the business um, aspect, the aspects of the business are properly ring fenced and firewalls with LLCs across the board to ensure that there is the, uh, the limited liability um, protection for each aspect of the business. Uh, and looking to make sure that the, the constitutional documents of those companies, i.e. The, i.e. the MOA, are properly established to ensure that, that those aspects, those parts of the business are also on sure legal footing. Um, well, yeah. I'm still a bit as well. Can you just talk a little bit more about the, uh, the bottom Sorry, structure? Yes. 
I think also, I mean, an, an important aspect or strength point of the structure is that the business and assets are completely insulated from any involvement from uh, inheritance courts. So the stakeholders are holding their interests in the holding company through SPVs. Any uh, 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 in, uh, inheritance interference will happen as, at the stakeholders' relevant SPVs without affecting the underlying businesses and assets. Also, we can see here that we have silo specialized vehicles as subholding entities for the sponsorship, for the property investment, for the manufacturing. This uh, structure uh, uh, is, 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 I mean, this is a preparation for maybe a future IPO where uh, uh, the, the founder or the family consider taking maybe one industry out of the family to IPO or, or maybe uh, uh, to sell down uh, a certain uh, uh, um, stake. So, uh, and, and I think another strength point is, is uh, uh, I believe banks should be comfortable with such a structure and, and uh, you know, corporate guarantees as opposed to personal guarantees because of, of the way uh, 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 the structure is designed. Sure, okay. Well, we've got a couple of questions. So we've been asked to give an example of the legally binding agreements. I, I think we, we've, we've sort of done that now, but just to reiterate, um, if you have a, um, a number of SPVs, you would enter into a shareholder agreement between those SPVs, or if you took out the SPVs and just had direct ownership by the family members in the holding company, then obviously you'd have a legally binding contract, which you want to make sure does dovetail with the constitutional documents of the, of the company, i.e. the MOA, or if it's a DIFC company or ADGM, for example, it's memorandum and articles of association. And in those documents, you can set out the legally binding provisions that will govern the ownership rights that those shareholders have in the business vis-a-vis uh, -vis their holding of shares. And you can talk about things such as preemption uh, and, and the sort of buyback mechanisms that you can utilize for the exit uh, route that, that, that we mentioned earlier. If it was a trust that was in place, then also you'd have a legally binding document in the form of a trustee. Now, trust law being what it is, it's not uh, that that is an equitable arrangement. It's a bit like a contract, except it's in equity as opposed to contract law. Uh, you can establish that now in, in, in a, a number of places in the GCC, but obviously in the UAE primarily, it'd be through the DIFC trust law or the AGM trust law. Uh, and and in, those, in that sense, the trust deed itself would be a legally binding document and would ensure that the beneficiaries, i.e. the family members, hold their interest in a, or have a proprietary interest in the legal ownership of the business, uh, and the trustee holds it for and on behalf of those individuals. And, and the benefit of a PTC is it's a company, so you can have a board of directors and you can populate that again with family members or with professionals or a mix of the two, uh, and that would control the family's interest in the business. And vis-a-vis -vis the business itself control the business because if you have a PTC owning a holding company, the PTC appoints the board of the holding company and hence uh, controls controls the business. Uh, what uh, We've mentioned it before but it's, mentioned, it's worth reiterating. It, it, it's very important to have a structure that will survive changes in family members because obviously every family changes over the generations. As long as the ownership um, is there in a legally binding form, but is separated out from control. And by that, what I really mean is to have either a requirement for unanimity, for example, under the trust law to under, under, uh, unwind the structure. And you can, you can actually um, stop that from happening. There's a, a very a key case in, um, in, in English trust law called Saunders and Vautier. There are ways to ensure that, and, and basically what that says is that all of the beneficiaries if they're of sound mind and majority can unwind the trust. There are ways to stop that happening by the introduction of, 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 of separate beneficiaries, and we could obviously we advise on that aspect of the business, and potentially here we're thinking about philanthropic elements being involved in the business. But basically, you can ensure that there's a legally binding structure, so the beneficiaries are always going to have their interest, it can never be taken away from them, but the business itself has a separate management, uh, and, and that also is run on a professional footing and will be continue, can, can continue to do so. So there are a number of different ways of ensuring that there is a legally binding arrangement. I think the reference to legally binding is important because we were talking about it in the context of family 
uh, constitution that doesn't necessarily have any reference to the underlying business structure. I mean, you know, regardless of how many um, LLCs you have or sole establishments or whatever it is, you can still have a family constitution, but it doesn't really mean anything if it doesn't actually describe and provide in a legally binding form for the structure that you've, you've, you're actually looking at. Um, and I think maybe now we should just answer the previous question about foundations. I mean, foundations are interesting in so far as they're very new in the region. I mean, they're not a common law um, concept originally. They're actually from uh, civil law in, in Europe. It's interesting. I can never pronounce it for not properly, but it's a sort of German Dutch concept. But it's found its way into common law in places like the Cayman Islands and now more recently here. Uh, and it is, in effect, an orphan entity, not to go into too much detail, but it doesn't have any shareholders, but it can operate in the same way. It has a founder, um, but once the founder's incorporated the foundation, that's really all the founder has to do with it. And so it's very useful for tax planning uh, in other parts of the world. Um, but it uh, operates in the same way as a trust can or a shareholder agreement can. So you can have um, you can have the, the interested persons being the family members. Uh, as to how it, it interacts with Sharia, well, I think the important thing to say is if you're putting in place a Sharia compliant structure, you are providing for the interest that that individual would have through Sharia. You're not taking away their interest and you're doing it in such a manner that any challenge that someone would bring in a Sharia court would be met with the, the counter argument, well, you know, you're not in disenfranchised any, in any way. There's nothing particular in Sharia that says you can't hold your interest through a foundation, for example. As long as you're ensuring that, you're, that the Sharia principles are, are adhered to and met, then, you know, notwithstanding this is a, a very new um, entity, so we, we, can't, uh, we can't point to precedent, but we, we are confident that these structures can be used in a, in a Sharia compliant manner. Well, you wanted to say something yes, on that? Yes, definitely. I mean, there's always this misunderstanding that certain structures are not Sharia compliant, such as trusts or foundations. It's very important to note that any structure is subject to a challenge from a Sharia perspective, even an onshore LLC or a disposition to an onshore LLC structure. It's whether the structure itself respects the Sharia principles or not. So you can have a foundation, as Richard said, or a trust. Uh, uh, that is Sharia compliant, that is even reviewed and signed off by a Sharia scholar. As long as it respects the elements and principles of Sharia, any structure can 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 be uh, uh, Sharia compliant. And it's also important to note that that um, 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 uh, 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 the disposition disposition itself to any structure also must be considered carefully in order to ensure that uh, uh, it is as, as, as uh, uh, to mitigate any risks from a Sharia perspective as well. So it's as, as robust as possible and watertight as possible. Well, we've been asked which structure is more strong against any challenge from heirs, the trust or the foundation, which, which may be an impossible question to answer, but, but what do you exactly. think? I mean, as I, as I said, uh, um, um, I think they both rank the same. Uh, it depends on the structure itself. On, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. You can't just, you know, uh, uh, automatically say the trust or, or the foundation. As I said, sometimes uh, the IFC trust structure is more robust from a Sharia perspective than an onshore LLC structure, where an onshore LLC structure, for example, uh, violates Sharia principles or disinherit uh, a specific child. Yeah, yeah. I think looking at the time, we should probably move on to the next topic yes. and we can come back to any other questions on this yeah. at the end if, if there are any. Um, so looking, as I said at the beginning, we are where we are uh, in, in the part of the world that we are, as, as in any of uh, obviously we're acting in a particular, operating in a particular legal and regulatory framework within that. Uh, and so we do have to, when we're thinking about restructuring family businesses, we can't divorce the business from the legal environment. So. Well, there, there are things that come out of that, aren't there? Yes, yes. I mean, um, when we consider the strategies for family business preservation and uh, basically putting the appropriate legal structure in place, uh, this should be uh, undertaken through a holistic approach. Um, uh, so there are many elements that we should consider together and hand in hand. 
starting with the family arrangements desired. As you said, Richard, there's no one size fits all. Each family is different. Each family has different objectives, different visions. There are so many questions to be asked, so many questions to be subject of dialogue between family members and involve family members on where they see their business in 10 years time, how they see their rights, obligations, what sort of governance, what sort of exit mechanism, what sort of you know valuation process. These uh, elements should all be considered and questions should be answered. A close look should be also uh, taken at the assets. What type of assets are involved? Uh, are they businesses, high-risk businesses? Are they real property assets, active, passive? Um, are they shares in entities, real property? Uh, where do the asset, where are these assets located? What jurisdictions are they within the GCC? Uh, are there any applicable local ownership restrictions? Are there any specific business licensing rules applicable? Uh, oh, I must sorry. Just to, sorry, interrupt. Just to interrupt you, I think it's worth just taking as example one particular asset class and one that we 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 have a lot of involvement with the regulator on and one that's always a problem. That's real estate, isn't it? Because yes, we, uh, we talk a little bit more about because nearly all of these family businesses have significant real estate assets. Yes, yes. Can we talk yes. about some of the base with that? As you said, I mean, the majority of the assets we see with family businesses are real estate property or real, real real estate assets. And real estate assets are subject to many restrictions in the region in principle. So there's, there's, there's more than one thing. There's the local ownership requirements, where this asset is located, freehold, onshore. Uh, what is the status of this asset? Is it granted property, so restricted, or is it just uh, 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 the status is freehold? So there's many elements and restrictions when it comes to real property. And maybe one of the most significant questions to ask is, what are the transfer costs associated with the restructuring of the real property? To give an example, for example, uh, Dubai Land Department treats the transfer of any shares, the movement of any shares in a structure that owns property as a transfer of the property itself, and hence imposes the transfer fee of, uh, on such transfer of shares. Uh, we, we saw a lot of cases where families uh, restructured their entities, transferred shares in entities that own real property, and then came to understand that they actually have to pay multiple transfer fees and pay penalty for not disclosing such movement of shares. So with real property assets, uh, uh, a careful legal due diligence should be undertaken to assess the status of the property, the restrictions on the transfer, the transfer costs involved, which can be significant in a, in a, when you have a big real property portfolio. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think tax as well is another key aspect of any restructuring because yes. what you don't want to do is introduce potential VAT issues uh, when you're looking to restructure. You may think that an intergroup arrangement is is immune, but but it's not because quite often we're not able to use the um, the, the exemption from VAT regime of transfer of a business as a whole because obviously there are little bits and aspects of the business being yes. moved from one part of the structure to another and unfortunately that is going to potentially incur uh, VAT. Yes, uh, definitely. Tax is a very important aspect, specifically as well if there's a, 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 a regional business involved where you know you have in other jurisdictions corporate tax uh, uh, and other sort of taxes. Uh, uh, I'm aware of the time. Just quickly, I want to talk about the costs. So other than the transfer costs uh, relating to real property, the cost of setting up and maintaining the structure is an important element. Obviously, you cannot compromise on uh, uh, on the structure uh, for the cost, but sometimes the cost might vary significantly. For example, onshore versus the IFC. Uh, many questions to ask is, you know, uh, uh, what is the cost involved for setting up, for maintaining the structure? Uh, uh, are we required to have a physical office? Uh, is there a minimum space? What are the other uh, 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 associated costs, uh, such as, you know, movement of shares, uh, registering with the different regulators, and so on. The final the point I, 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 uh, I also want to stress on is the type of business and, and what regulated activities is the group or the entities involved in. Um, is there a specific legal form 
that is required by law for carrying out the specific activity? Are there any business licensing rules requirements? Are you in commercial agencies, for example? Uh, uh, is there a track record requirement? What sort of an experience is required? It's very important to approach this holistically rather than uh, uh, work on the um, um, upstream structure and deal with the family governance and family structure while neglecting the assets and the ongoing business because it goes hand in hand. There's Definitely. no point of having the perfect trust structure that addresses all the family issues and objectives if it cannot work in practice. Oh, totally. And, and, you know, quite often that's the approach that people take and, and, and they're disguising issues that then come back to bite them later. So it's very important to, to look at the entire business to ensure that any post-succession uh, uh, restructuring is done uh, to ensure that there are no issues at any point in the structure that can come back to, to all of them. Um, I think looking at the time, let's very briefly, Noel, um, talk about the Sharia aspects that we just wanted yes. to touch upon uh, and then we have had at least one more question anyway so we will just at the end and answer those questions once we've finished on that on that topic yes I mean as we said um, Sharia uh, aspect is a very critical element to the families in the region and this aspect cannot be uh, neglected or, or, or you know it should be addressed very carefully uh, as I previously said, there's always this misunderstanding that a trust structure is not Sharia compliant. And we often, Richard, as you know, sit with families and founders and, you know, we mention trust and he says, I don't want anything to upset uh, 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 God. And we say, no, I mean, we can't set up a, a trust structure or a foundation structure that is fully Sharia compliant. We can, or to the extent possible, Sharia compliant. Um, uh, and as I said, any structure is open to challenge. It's not about the structure itself, it's how you design the structure and what arrangements you have under the structure and how is the disposition of assets and disposition by a founder to a structure uh, 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 analyzed and how is it considered. Um, and there are, uh, I mean, it's very important also to note, uh, to note that the Islamic principles and Islamic Sharia did provide tools to assist families in their succession planning. There are several tools that can be used by families, such as Hiba or such as wills. Some of these are actions taken through, uh, throughout the lifetime uh, uh, of a founder or of a person. Others are uh, actions that only are applicable and valid after death. However, there are several tools that we can use under Islamic Sharia to assist us in putting in place the proper uh, uh, family uh, succession planning uh, 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 that is Sharia compliant. Yeah, great. Well, no, I think I think there's a general point to make there. Um, also, while I get the questions up, uh, is that you know you need to look at the aspects of Sharia inheritance when you're structuring and designing the, the structure, as you say, and, and you need to ensure that it's done in a manner which not only uh, respects Sharia, but also meets the, uh, the, the, the ideals of, of the family to ensure that, that for example, if, if they want <clears throat> a structure that uh, is only inherited and continued to be inherited by family members of, of the bloodline, that that's done in a way that is still Sharia, which obviously means yeah. ensuring that people who have a, a right to inherit under Sharia are dealt with appropriately. And, and that's not unique anyway to these structures. I mean, that's how the inheritance court and how the local regulators will work. For example, if you had commercial agency yeah. and someone that wasn't a UAE national um, inherited through Sharia, well, what happens there? I mean. These are issues that are already faced before people like you and I come along to restructure yes. new businesses. I think the important thing is to be aware of them and to use the, the tools uh, uh, that, we, as I said, we, we're now very you know, blessed to have in, in the region through the, uh, the innovative laws that have been in, uh, put in place in, in the UAE and, and the wider GCC to, to enable these sort of structures to, to actually work in a Sharia manner. Yes, anyway, yes. Uh, and uh, sorry. sorry, just a final comment. Basically, um, um, there are many tools, whether under the Sharia uh, 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 principles or now with the financial free zones we have in the UAE, uh, providing uh, uh, the trust structures, the foundations, which have proven to be uh, uh, very suitable vehicles for family succession planning. And maybe one point also to raise is that 
fortunately, uh, uh, regulators and authorities throughout the region, not only in the UAE, are becoming more comfortable with these uh, structures, are becoming more, uh, are acknowledging the importance of using these structures in the context of family succession planning. And we can see that, for example, one of the examples is the Dubai Land Department now being more uh, acknowledging more the trust structures in uh, the context of the land depart, uh, in the context of family succession planning. So I think you know there's a general uh, uh, positive approach uh, 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 towards such structures that can uh, uh, more or less achieve what families uh, uh, want. No, definitely. I mean, I, I think that's 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 really positive news, both basically for the wider. Uh, environment because you know wealth preservation for family businesses is, is key because family businesses drive I think it's like 80% of the you know regional economy so, yeah. so without these family businesses we wouldn't be where we are so it's, it's very important for regulators to appreciate that, that the uh, that the issues that these family businesses are facing now in terms of succession uh, that they're not seen to be creating further impediments to, to stop that that wealth transmission Anyway, well, we're pretty much up, so let's just answer some questions. So, I understand you don't specifically recommend the shareholders' agreement on a holding company level. Is it because the AOA of the holding company would cover the necessary arrangements? Would there be any cases where a shareholders' agreement is also needed in addition to the AOA, or the AOA would cover all the arrangements? Well, I think, just straight up, I don't think we're saying we don't specifically recommend a shareholders' agreement. I think sometimes we would recommend it. I think. The point is, is that every family is different, every structure is different. The issues that can arise is where you have an onshore limited liability company with a shareholders agreement that doesn't align with the memorandum association, because the way the company's law works, <clears throat> the courts may determine that that shareholder agreement is null and void. But then again, if we're putting in place a holding structure, for example, in the DIFC, uh, in the common law environment, it's very common to have a shareholder agreement, and that definitely would be enforced. So, if we were in the DIFC, I think we would be having a shareholder agreement. We would, we might even be recommending one in the onshore environment. It's obviously the devil is yeah. in the detail. What does it actually say? So, I don't think no, no. We're not saying we wouldn't recommend it. I'm saying that depending upon the structure, we either would place significant importance on a shareholder agreement, or or potentially we wouldn't. And to be honest with you, we wouldn't more so if we're sticking with uh, limited liability companies as the uh, as the holding vehicle so we wouldn't necessarily re recommend those in the first place or at least if we are in, uh, uh, structuring uh, a business with those which sometimes we do because it's a particular family requirement the family members have to know about the the restrictions and what that will actually mean for them in the future in terms of what the commercial companies law uh, um, provides for yeah. And if we do recommend the shareholders agreement, we try to, for example, you know, put uh, 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 the parties to the shareholders agreement as per the example we gave before on the optimal structure as, you know, uh, vehicles rather than individuals to create a stable uh, uh, shareholder base uh, for the parties to the shareholder agreement. We try to the extent possible to have the shareholder uh, agreement terms uh, 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 not violate uh, the commercial company's law. Obviously, as Richard said, I mean, when comparing shareholders agreement onshore to a shareholders agreement uh, for the IFC entities, there are certain weaknesses given the, the, the MOA being the official document uh, recognized by law and by courts for limited liability companies onshore. Okay, so next question, would you have any recommendations regarding protecting family wealth and family members to protect personal decisions, bankruptcy or debt? of a specific family member, thank you. Well, I, I think the important thing there really is quite straightforward and simple, is that if a family member is going to get themselves into financial difficulty, that it shouldn't have any, it shouldn't expose or have any uh, successive effects on the family business itself. At the end of the day, those family members' um, <clears throat> personal affairs should be personal to them, and it shouldn't overflow and pollute any uh, family business structure. So again, talking about the separation of ownership uh, and, and control, what that also means is separating out what is personally yours from what is collectively the family's. And you can do that through, I mean, if we haven't talked much about trusts, but for example, if we had a trust, um, you'd have a, an ownership right. Um, the trust itself would be protected from the bankruptcy of the beneficiary, because that's a principle of, 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 of trust, or at least 
if the trust is drafted in the right way it is so if that person is bankrupt then you know that's that's their own affairs now if the company decides to or the family as a whole through its ownership uh, decides to assist that family member through you know any particular difficulty that they have or well, that you can provide for that in the trust structure for example you can securitize their beneficial arrangements and, and make loans to the family member if, if that was felt appropriate but i think the most important point to make is you know if someone is unfortunately suffering from bad decisions in relation to their personal affairs that that doesn't have an, uh, an overrun and, and affects negatively uh, the family business. Next question. I mean, they also, sorry, that question also talked about protecting family wealth. Well, I mean, obviously, these large families can have significant personal assets in terms of residential property, you know, expensive artwork or cash deposits or passive investments or a yacht, you know, who knows what, what the assets are. Now, one Thing that we often see uh, that's, that's quite a common theme uh, in terms of um, significant ultra high net worth uh, families is the utilization of family office structures we can provide for those within a structure or separate from a structure which deals primarily with family business assets and you can consolidate your the, the family's private wealth if you like and you can also have that professionally managed or through a family office and, and that's a particular aspect that can be part and parcel of a, of a restructuring if it was felt that that was necessary. For example, if the residential uh, property is in the name of individuals, but it's there to be shared by the family, well, that's not going to work. So, you, you, you know, you, you can look at these sorts of um, other assets uh, as well as the family. Uh, another question regarding protection of family, sorry, break that one. Um, oh, regarding protection of family wealth, family members, oh, I think it's the same question that's been repeated. Yeah, so I think that's it in terms of questions. So um, if we don't get any other questions in the next 10 seconds or so, then I think we have reached the end of the presentation. Um, that's, we've run over by a few minutes. So thank you everybody very much for your attention. I hope that was useful and interesting. Our contact details on the slide. So of course, if there are any other further questions or topics of discussion that you would like to discuss afterwards, we'd be very happy to hear them and thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you everyone everyone for your attendance. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.